Friday, the 13th, Part 2, a novel by Simon Hawk based on the screenplay written by Ron Kurtz, based on characters created by Victor Miller. Some nightmares never go away, even after you wake up. Alice thrashed beneath her sweat-soaked sheets, crying out and moaning in her sleep, pursued by some hideous thing she never could have dreamed of, because although she was seized in the grip of a terrifying nightmare, it had been no dream. This nightmare had been real. It had happened earlier that summer at Camp Crystal Lake, a few rustic cabins on a quiet lakeshore, a peaceful atmosphere that was shattered one night by frenzied, throat-rending screams that wouldn't stop. Her own screams. She found Bill hanging on the door of the workshed, impaled on a coat hook, his ruined body hacked and stabbed, his eye transfixed by an arrow. There was blood everywhere. Screaming, she ran back to the main cabin where she bolted the doors and threw up a barricade. She had never been so frightened in her life. She huddled in the kitchen of the cabin, afraid to move, afraid to breathe. And then Brenda's blood-caked body came crashing through the window, hurled with superhuman force to land lifeless on the floor. Blood was matted in her hair. Her arms and legs were trussed up with rope, and her body was pierced with stab wounds. Alice screamed as though she'd never stop. All of them were dead. All her friends, Nettie with his throat slashed, Annie butchered the same way, Jack with an arrow driven through his throat, Marcy's skull split by an axe. She fled, terror-stricken, into the night, running toward the headlights of the approaching jeep, thinking that it was Steve Christie coming back from town, never suspecting that he was dead. She pulled up short as, not Steve, but a stranger got out of the jeep. The stranger was a tall, blonde woman, dressed in dark slacks and a white woolen sweater. And if Alice hadn't been so terrified, she might have noticed the particular tightness around the woman's mouth, the slightly glazed, unfocused look about her eyes, the telltale bulge on her belt beneath her sweater. Who are you? Alice cried, scared out of her wits. The woman smiled. It was a strained smile that came too quickly. Why, I'm Mrs. Voorhees, she had said. An old friend of the Christie's. No! Alice twisted in the tangled sheets and cried out in her sleep, trying to make herself wake up. Somewhere deep in her subconscious mind, she knew it was a dream, and she tried to wake up so she could escape from it. But like the reality that fueled the dream, the nightmare was tenacious, and it would not let go. No! No! she shouted, reliving the past in her dream, pulling back from Mrs. Voorhees. They're dead. They're all dead. All right, I'll go look, said Mrs. Voorhees calmly, as if she did not believe her. No, don't leave me, Alice cried. They'll kill you too. No, she cried again in her sleep. She tossed and turned in the torn-up bed, vainly trying to wrench herself out of the dream. In the cabin, they stood together over Brenda's mutilated body. A strange look came over Mrs. Voorhees' face, an intense, distant expression. She suddenly looked like an altogether different person as she spoke about the mystery of Crystal Lake the savage, unsolved murders of two young summer camp counselors. Did you know that a boy drowned the year before those two others were killed? said Mrs. Voorhees, her eyes glazing over. Her voice became bitter, 
her mouth twisted into a sneer. The counselors were not paying enough attention. They were making love when that young boy drowned. Her voice took on a frightening edge, an edge of madness. His name was Jason, she said. She started to walk slowly toward Alice, her eyes glittering with rage. I was working here the day it happened, preparing meals. I was the cook. Suddenly, she grabbed Alice by the shoulders, her grip astonishingly powerful, her fingers digging in like talons. Jason should have been watched every minute. He wasn't a very good swimmer. Her eyes seemed to blaze and her lips drew back from her teeth in a savage snarl as she shook Alice hard enough to make her teeth rattle. You let him drown, she shouted. You never paid any attention. She shoved Alice away hard and lifted up her sweater, revealing the large hunting knife in the leather sheath on her belt. Look what you did to him, she hissed as she pulled out the knife and lunged at Alice. In desperation, Alice grabbed the first thing that came to hand, a fireplace poker, and swung it at the mad woman with all her might. Mrs. Voorhees grunted as the poker struck her. She staggered and fell to the floor. Alice ran screaming out into the night. Behind her, Mrs. Voorhees slowly rose, her eyes wild, burning with the light of madness. She spoke in the voice of a small boy, the voice of her son, Jason. Kill her, Mommy. Kill her. Don't let her get away, Mommy. Don't let her live. And in her own voice, she answered with grim determination. I won't, Jason. I won't. Alice whimpered in her sleep, her fingers clutching at the sheet spasmatically, her head thrashing back and forth. In the dream, she fled screaming from the crazy woman, but there was no escape. Cornered at the lake, she had fought with desperation, finally managing to break free of the insane killer and pick up the machete she had dropped during their struggle. Without even realizing what she was doing, Alice swung the machete with all her might. She cried out in her sleep at the nightmarish vision of the woman's head coming off, a vision that had plagued her dreams ever since that awful night. She had awakened in the county hospital, unable to remember how she got there. She remembered scrambling back, away from Mrs. Voorhees' decapitated body, pumping blood out onto the ground. She got into a boat and pushed off from the shore, feeling numb with shock, wanting only to get as far away from that frightening cadaver as she could. She drifted slowly out into the middle of the lake until the sun came up, dissipating the gray mist and sending shimmers of light racing across the surface. Half in a daze, she seemed to recall seeing the police car pulling up to the dock, the officers getting out and calling to her. And then the rotting corpse of a small boy broke the surface of the lake with a blood-freezing scream. The corpse wrapped its arms around her, pulling her over the side of the boat and dragging her down into the water. Two of my men pulled you out of the lake, Sergeant Tierney had told her. We thought you were dead too. Do you remember very much? The boy, Alice had said. Is he dead too? Who? said Tierney. The boy, she repeated. Jason. The policeman hesitated, frowning. Jason? In the lake, she insisted. The one who attacked me. The one who pulled me underneath the water. Ma'am, said Tierney, with a worried look. We didn't find any boy. Then he's still there, said Alice, her voice echoing in her mind like an ominous warning. 
Still there, still there, still there. She awoke with a start, gasping for breath and crying out. It took her a moment to realize that she was safe in her own room, that it had only been a nightmare, all the more terrifying because it had really happened to her. She placed her hand against her chest and felt her heart pounding away like a jackhammer. When would she finally be able to find peace? She crawled out of her bed and went into the bathroom. She leaned against the sink. Her knees felt weak. The dreams exhausted her, leached all the energy away, and left her feeling like some sort of zombie, staggering around in a trance. She wasn't getting enough sleep. She couldn't remember the last time she had a good eight hours, or even six, or four. Yes, she could. Before the nightmare started. Before Camp Crystal Lake. Glancing at her reflection in the bathroom mirror, she realized how terrible she looked. She was losing weight. There were deep bags beneath her eyes. Her hands were shaking, and the slightest noise made her jump. When the phone rang, she almost had a heart attack. She took a deep breath, trying to calm herself as it rang again. And then she went to answer it. She already knew who it would be. Hello? She said with resignation as she sank down onto the couch. Hi, Mom. I know. I'm sorry. I meant to call you, but I fell asleep. She realized how emotionally drained she sounded and tried to inject a note of cheerfulness into her voice. Really, Mom? I'm fine. I just need a little time alone, that's all. I... Her mother interrupted like she always did, and Alice tried to listen patiently. Her mother didn't understand. How could she ever understand? How could anyone understand unless they had been there? Unless they had seen what she had seen? I know you and Dad worry, and I appreciate that. She said as soon as her mother took a breath. I... Her mother interrupted once again, and this time Alice didn't let it pass. Come on, Mom, she said sharply. We've been through all this before. I just have to put my life back together, and this is the only way I know how. Her mother wasn't listening. She never listened. Never even tried to. Mom, please... Alice said, exasperated. It's late, and I don't want to get into it. I'll call you tomorrow. Bye. She hung up the phone. Why couldn't anybody understand? All right, maybe she had imagined it. How could the boy have come up from the bottom of the lake to drag her under? He had drowned years ago. His body would have decomposed long since. And if he had lived... He would have been a full-grown man by now. Yet, she was certain she had seen something. According to the police report, she was hysterical when the officers swam out to get her. They said that she had fought them, clawing at them, screaming at them to let her go. She didn't remember any of that. Perhaps she had fallen out of the boat and they had seen it. And when they swam out to rescue her, her tortured mind deceived her into thinking that it wasn't a policeman trying to pull her to safety, but a rotting corpse trying to pull her under. Anyway, that's what the psychiatrist had suggested, and it seemed to make sense. After what she had been through, it wasn't surprising that her mind should have come a bit unhinged. But she wasn't really sure. She knew she had seen something, and lately, ever since she had returned to Crystal Lake, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched, as if there was something out there, waiting for her. Her mother thought that she was going crazy. Why, after all the horrible things that had happened to her there, would she want to return to the town of Crystal Lake? Every night her mother called, Every night it was the same discussion, 
always the same old arguments. Come home, honey. Come home where we can take care of you, her mother always said. We'll see this thing through together. We'll get the finest doctors. We'll do whatever it takes. Her parents simply didn't understand. What it took was going back to where it had all happened. The camp itself had been shut down, and the buildings had all been condemned. But she came back to the town of Crystal Lake, where people did not know who she was since her picture had been kept out of the papers when it happened. There she could confront her private demons by herself, confront them and beat them, or be consumed by them. She had no choice. There was just no other way. In a sense, she had never really left the place. After being discharged from the hospital, she had gone home to her parents, but each night after she fell asleep, she wound up back at Camp Crystal Lake again, reliving the horror. She would try to stay awake, knowing that it was impossible, knowing that she had to get some sleep, but dreading it because she knew what sleep would bring. And when, inevitably, she would finally fall asleep from sheer exhaustion, the nightmare would begin again. She tried explaining it to her parents when they told her it was foolish to go back. What do you mean, go back? She shouted at them in exasperation. Don't you understand? I've never left. I'm still trapped there. I'll never get away. When she got up from the couch and went back toward the bathroom, her eyes fell on the sketches she had been working on earlier in the day. She had done them in charcoal, shades of gray and black. There was a time, not so very long ago, when she had been a talented, versatile artist. She had enjoyed drawing still-life studies and landscapes, full figures and portraits, but the last thing she had done that looked anything like her former work was the portrait she drew of Steve back at Camp Crystal Lake. That's when the nightmare started. Ever since, all her drawings came out looking like this, dark, gloomy, and foreboding, gray shading into darker gray shading into black. Studies of faces with wide eyes and bulging mouths open in soundless screams. She had once seen a documentary on television about children who had suffered traumas from abuse. Their drawings didn't look anything like children's drawings. No sunlit houses with picket fences and gardens and stick figure people drawn in warm bright colors. No, those drawings looked like hers. Dark, savage terrifying, the subconscious mind reliving the violence that had been done to it, and crying out for help. She went into the bathroom and turned on the shower. The phone rang once again. Sighing, she went back into the living room and picked up the phone. Why couldn't her mother just leave her alone? Why couldn't she understand that the only chance she had of beating this thing was to come back here and face it? prove to herself once and for all that it was over, that there were no more monsters lurking in the dark. Mom, she said into the phone. There was no answer on the other end. Hello? Still no response. It was not her mother. She could hear only the sound of heavy breathing. She slammed the phone down and backed away from it, swallowing hard, trying to compose herself. It's all right, she tried to tell herself. There's nothing to worry about. It was probably just some kids playing games. Nothing to be afraid of. People who called other people up just to breathe heavily into the phone weren't really dangerous, were they? She went over to the window and pulled back the drape, taking a look outside. It was dark and the streets of Crystal Lake were rain-slicked. There didn't appear to be anyone out there, but it was hard to tell with all those shadows. In her present state of mind, every shadow seemed to be a prowler, a huge shape lurking in the darkness, waiting, watching. Her heart started to beat faster, 
Okay, this is ridiculous, she told herself. The phone rings, and all of a sudden, you're jumping at shadows. It was probably a wrong number. She checked the chain and deadbolt on the door. Then she checked the hall. She knew it seemed foolish to be creeping around her own apartment, but she couldn't shake the awful feeling that had suddenly come over her. The almost certain feeling that she was not alone. She checked the bedroom, then looked in the kitchen. She felt a cool breeze. The window was wide open. A knot formed in her stomach. She was almost certain that she had shut it earlier. She suddenly felt short of breath. There was a tightness in her chest. She couldn't take her eyes away from the gently blowing curtains on either side of the wide open window. Slowly, she moved toward the window, picking up an ice pick from the sideboard on the sink and holding it like a knife, ready for stabbing. She shut her eyes and took a deep breath. Suddenly, something came flying through the window, straight at her, and she gasped and recoiled with shock, then leaned back against the refrigerator with relief when she realized it had only been the cat. Oh, it's you, she said, exhaling heavily, feeling foolish for overreacting like that. Obviously, she must have left the window open earlier and the cat got out that way. I've just got to calm down, she thought. I've got to relax before I lose my mind and run screaming out into the street. She put the ice pick down on the counter, then ran a little water into the tea kettle, which she sat on the stove, turning the burner on high. She took down a box of tea bags and got out a cup and spoon. The cat rubbed against her legs, meowing. You want to eat, huh? Okay. She went back to the refrigerator and opened it. The severed, bloody head of Mrs. Voorhees was resting on the top shelf between the milk and the half-empty box of chocolate graham crackers. The mouth was open and the tongue protruded from between the rotting teeth like a dead slug. The stench of decomposing flesh was overpowering. Alice threw her hands up to her face and screamed. She backed away, turning to run. And suddenly, a massive arm was clamped across her throat, throttling her scream, choking it off. She saw the flash of the ice pick she had left lying on the counter, and she had only the briefest instant to register the awful realization that her worst nightmares were coming true before the point of the ice pick was driven through her temple. She felt a sharp, searing, white-hot pain. Then she fell lifeless to the floor. The tea kettle started whistling. The killer took it off the burner and conscientiously turned off the gas.